السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may he bless every single one of us and grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, I'm so happy to be here for the first time in this uh, beautiful country and city where the opportunities are so great and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed uh, us in a different way. Primarily we are Muslimin, we are Mu'mineen. And we must never lose focus upon that because that is the biggest gift that we have. We are Muslims and Mu'min. We are people who have surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time, we are people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This morning we will be speaking about parenting inshallah. And I see there are a few categories of people in front of me. We have the children themselves who are here, inshallah. Perhaps they will take a page for the day they are parents. And we have people who are parents and perhaps those who are not yet parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and grant us offspring and those who will be the coolness of our eyes. Point number one I want to raise is the point of dua. If you look at the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he made dua for himself and his progeny. Oh Allah, bless me with progeny who will be serving your cause. And then when he had a child, he says, Oh Allah, make us surrenderers. Ij'alna muslimayni lak. Make the two of us those who surrendered to you. So my brothers and sisters, dua is very, very important. Dua. Never remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the equation. Some people make a mistake by not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them and guide them being parents. Ya Allah help me, guide me. I have this responsibility of children. Uh, you are the one who bestowed me with these children. Ya Allah open the doors for me. This is very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner. He does things. He can facilitate that which we might feel is impossible. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reduce that which we feel is so easily achievable, making it difficult for us to achieve. That is Allah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. The second thing we need to know also is our duty unto Allah. Without us understanding who we are, why we are here, we will never be able to guide our children. Never ever. You need to know who you are. Why are you in this world? Many times people who are living in countries that are not their native countries are there for purposes of the dunya. That's the, that's the primary aim a lot of the times. For economic reasons we are here, for financial reasons we are here, in most of the cases. Some cases might be different, but it's not wrong to be here for financial reasons, but it is wrong to give that preference over... Sorry brother, there's a bit of feedback on this uh, microphone, which is an irritation, yeah, I'm so sorry to say it like that. Uh, I can put it closer to my mouth if you'd like. Okay. So, sorry, I, I don't feel bad, brother, so don't feel bad. Yeah. So, if we are here for the right reasons, we will actually be able to understand how to direct our own lives and how to direct the lives of those whom we are responsible for. This is something that's extremely important. I don't wish to harp on it too much because every one of us, every one of us needs to ask himself, why are you here? And if your aim is solely financial, then just mend it a little bit, inshallah, and tell yourself, I'm here to make life easy in the way that I can earn Jannah. To make life easy in a way that I can earn Jannah. 
Now, getting to our topic, the responsibility of children, this is part of the system and the plan of Allah. When Allah wants, He gives a person no children. And when Allah wants, He gives them children. Notice what I said. When Allah wants, He gives you no children. Which means He gave you, but no children. We didn't say He did not give you. We said He gave you no children. It's a gift. He knows why. I've come across people who don't have children. Some of them are very upset with the decree of Allah and others are not. They, are, they have now understood. So we surrender. We want things. We work towards things. May Allah bless us all with children. Those who don't have children, may Allah bless you miraculously with children. Amen. But at the end of the day, it's Allah's plan. He knows why. There are people who cannot manage and cannot cope to see the death of their own children or their sickness in their lives in a way that will depress them more than had they not had the children at all. So we need to understand the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, it's good to say, I want to have kids and mashallah, I've got so many boys and so many girls, oh, I've got a child and so on. But, but, do we understand that that is an amana from Allah? We are taught to raise that child in a specific way. And we are taught to be role models of the child in order for that child to become a person who will then be able to lead. If we don't do that, we are losers. Now, I've got a few points that I've written. The reason why I've written it down is parenting is something we can talk about forever and ever. We can speak about it forever. Every one of you has different experiences and we can all learn from your experience. And as time passes, some of the methodology changes, some of the systems change, although the core uh, aim is the same. Although perhaps the fundamentals are the same, but the methodology changes, sometimes the approach changes with the changing of time and so on. And that also is extremely important because we don't want to fail uh, in parenting. So I've already spoken about our duty unto Allah, the issue of dua, uh, the, the responsibility or the gift of a child when Allah's blessed you with a child that we need to pass on this message. So what is parenting? It's a question. What is parenting? We will say many things. Look, I'm a father, so I'm a parent. So parenting is to look after my children. That's a simple, straightforward answer. But if we take a careful look at it, you will find that parenting is a process. A process of caretaking and education through which you help your child grow from a dependent child to an independent adult. Your child is dependent on you initially. You want them to grow to become an independent adult. How you do that, that process is known as parenting. So always tell yourself, this child of mine, how will the child become an independent adult who is fully grown, understanding his or her duties as a Muslim and his or her place in this world and the contribution to the rest of humanity and to the deen and so on. So... When we have this in mind and we have this as the focus, inshallah, we will be able to achieve by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes people love their children so much that they begin to do things that are detrimental for the child without realizing that this particular child, the love that I have for the child is governed by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means, I cannot use the word love to allow the child not to be corrected. To allow the child not to be told. The way I tell the child, it can change from with the changing of time or depending on the uh, situation and so on. But I need to say something. The love of your child must make you correct the child, must make you raise the child in a proper way. So parenting is about expressing love and it's a matter of education and training. So as a parent, you influence your child by the example you give or the model that you show the child. You are a model. The child watches you. You know, children, they mimic. They, f they follow you. From a very early age, you and I know that as Muslimin, all of us, inshallah, we read Salah. And those who have children will guarantee that or will confirm that if you read your Salah often and if you dress in a specific way, your children 
from a very early age will want to be like you. This is the plan of Allah. And this is why we say, my brothers and sisters, right at the beginning, Allah gives you almost 100% control of what to do to the child. Almost 100%. What that means is, who gives the name? You. You give a good name, inshallah. Who dresses the child? You. Dress them properly. Where do you take the child? Or who is the one who takes the child here and there? You. Who decides which uh, learning group the child will go to? You. Children cannot even speak sometimes to tell you, I don't want to go to that learning group initially. And as the child go, grows, Allah takes away from you that control one by one. It goes away. So initially, whatever you do to the child, say for example the clothing, you can make your baby wear whatever you want. Whatever you want. So make sure it's clothing that is compliant to the sharia. You can make your child listen to whatever you want. You can play the Quran whole day. So let's not play Bollywood songs inshallah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah has kept that early learning system, the one that is very fresh. Allah has kept it such that whatever comes into the system at that initial stage remains for a longer time. It comes back, it remains, it's stronger. You know, a child who becomes a hafiz sometimes has a more solid uh, hifz of the Quran than a person who became a hafiz a little bit later on in life. It happens because, and in that early age, still your hard drive is free, basically. Uh, you know, once it gets contaminated with so many things, there are a few viruses, Allah protect us, then you need an antivirus, and your mind is occupied with so many things, your worries and so on, your memory might become slightly weaker, although it's not the same with everyone. So, initially you have the say, you have everything. Then, when the child grows a little bit older, it's no longer that the child becomes excited with the toy you buy. When the child is little, you can buy the child a little... Uh, you know, what do they call it? That, that a rattle, a rattle. And the child will be excited, you know, with a rattle and, and smiling and, and hee hee and giggling and so on. Try buying the rattle when the child is five years old. They'll throw it at your face. Say, Dad, you think I'm a little baby? So, initially you choose. Then there comes a time when Allah takes it away. Watch that happening. Watch it. Because you don't notice, you don't realize, but it happens. So when you have control, it's your duty to fulfill to your best what you have to. Because when the control goes, by that time, you should have given the child the rod and taught it how to fish. There you are. So as the child grows, you, you want to instill Islam into a child later on in life, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But if you instill it initially from the beginning without saying any words, it will be ingrained in the upbringing of the child. So the child will automatically, in your absence, still be the positive person that the child always was based on how you brought up that particular child during the days when the child did not really have a say, but you had the say. So this is extremely important. Then the initial schools you send your children to, very, very important because, because, you have a say. Primary school, how many people's children have told them from grade one that I don't want to go to this school? They might be, maybe nowadays, but it will be very little. Most of the cases, you are the one who decides that, look, we're going to go to this school, that institute, this, you know, this is what will happen. You choose. When we choose, let's be careful to balance out the deen and the dunya. I think in this country, you have more options than people from other countries. So that which is, if you have chosen a school which is purely secular, make sure you balance it with that or with some form of education that will uh, nurture the child spiritually as well. So some people forget this, the spiritual part of it, thinking that my child has gone to the best school. I went to a very, very good school, but with that we were doing hef. With that, we were doing our diniyat. With that, we were doing so many other issues, subjects, and so on. Uh, and I would, I would like to think that today there are some schools who have married the two, made it a little bit easier. But you need to follow up to make sure that it's not uh, deficient. Because like with us, a lot of us have multivitamins, maybe once a day, uh, once uh, every so often. Why? Because we want to supplement. It's called a supplement. 
you eat, mashallah, you drink, but you just want a supplement so that you feel good or so that it does some form of benefit to you. So sometimes you have a system where the, uh, Islam is integrated with the secular studies, good mashallah, but look into it, it might not be enough, you might need a supplement. You might need one more multivitamin, uh, perhaps in, uh, once a week or maybe even a little bit more than that. There comes a stage when your child will tell you, Dad, I don't want to go to the school. If you're sending me to this college, I don't want to study. What is this? This is Allah showing you that you know your control over the child is diminishing. There comes a time when your child will tell you that I don't want this toy. And I don't want to wear these clothes. It's over. I'm not going with you. If, if I'm not wearing what I want, I'm not coming with you. Finished. If you don't come to pick me up with that vehicle from school, I'm going to walk home. Have you heard that happening? It happens because dad's got a nice car in the garage and the child says, but dad, why is it just in the garage? For what? Use it. And they'll even bring for you evidence from the Quran to say, you know what? Use what Allah has given you, you know? <laughs> so this is all Allah's plan. Allah's showing you that your control is diminishing until you get to the point of marriage. Marriage is the decision of the child through the guidance of the parents. That's what it is. Even the females. In Islam, there is, you cannot compel someone. No. That's, a, that's wrong. Some people think that. It's wrong. You cannot force someone to say, you will marry. They have a right. Male and female. They have a right to reject, to refuse, to say, no, I don't want. But the guidance of the parent cannot just come suddenly now that you are 20 years old. And now today you want to marry someone and I come and I say, no. But dad, you never ever guided me through the last 20 years to show me what I should look at and how, what I should be careful of. Today you want to come into my life. I appreciate it. But I'm sorry, it's a bit too late. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So from an early age, we've got to nurture, we've got to guide. We've got to make sure that they know, they realize that the decisions we, go, we are going to make in life that are very, very important. At that stage, perhaps we might be too emotionally inclined to people to be able to listen to them, or to be able to listen to others. If someone is emotionally hooked to a person of the opposite sex, for example, and they really want to get married, a lot of the times people are promising each other marriage before they've even spoken to their parents. That's unhealthy. It should not be the case. They should have told you day one, this is who I met, before they are attached. But today the attachment is over, the promises are over, they, they promise each other we're going to fight for each other. Already it's there. Now, people might say, okay, you know, it's wrong, or it's right. That's not the discussion today. The discussion is, don't leave it to get to that stage. That's the discussion. I mean, some of us might have gone through this already. And those who, who might be happy, some might not be happy, some might have learnt and so on. It, it was a gamble and Alhamdulillah we took it. But it's important if you want to play a role in your child's decision of who they will marry, it doesn't start at the age of 20, it starts very early. I would say perhaps at about 10, 11, the discussion can slowly come in in different ways, not direct to sit a 10-year-old child and say, right, listen, when you're getting married, I mean, that's a 10-year-old child, grow up, man, subhanAllah. But slowly but surely, you know, something can come in, uh, a little pointer or two, maybe stories of some people, uh, perhaps the Sahaba radiallahu anhum or some of the Anbiya, uh, something that is befitting that particular age in a specific way. And as the child grows, you can become more specific. And you, we need to have open discussion, especially in today's age, very open discussion with our own children. Because sometimes our children are orphans with both parents. Why? Because the father has no time. That's the thing. No time. I have no time. So your child is an orphan. Mother, too busy with makeup and accessories and everything else and you know so what she looks like. So she won't mind spending half an hour in front of the mirror, but she cannot spend half an hour with the child. I'm not talking of all mothers. I mean, come on. We all have the best of wives, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Uh, who are good to their, to their children. But this, is, is, this idea is growing. Or should I say this problem is on the increase, on the rise, where there are orphans in our own homes. It happens more so in affluent homes. Sometimes we don't realize, you know, the au pair or the, one, the, the, the guardian or the child minder is looking after the child and we are not bothered. When last have you sat with your child and had a good discussion? The fathers. We can do better. 
So your child might be an orphan in your own home. So what happens when they need to say something, they say it to the wrong people, to their friends. They get advice from the television, from the internet. They get advice from a direction that is not supposed to be the primary source of their direction. Yet, we were there, but we didn't have time for them. So they were worse than orphans because orphans, you know, they, they, they don't have options sometimes. But with these, we have the options. And then we get upset that my child is inclined in this direction or that direction without realizing, where was I? Where was I all these years? Why didn't I play a big role? And I always tell people, you know, my brothers and sisters, uh, when you work, ask yourself, how much do I want to earn? So put yourself a target. And say you want to earn a million, for example. Just an example. I didn't say what. It could be rupees. It could be anything. <laughs> say you want to set yourself a target of a million. Okay, you set it. Beyond that, remember one thing. You may find it much more beneficial to cut your hours of work than to increase you the amount of wealth you're earning. This is something, especially for those who have their own work. You know, those who are self-employed. Initially, to build the business, you might have to do things yourself and you might work very hard. We hope that your spouse is understanding and we hope that you are compensating the lost time with your children by taking them out often whenever you are with them or spending weekends at least with them and talking to them in a beautiful way, listening to them. We'll get to a few of these pointers in a few moments. But uh, if you do not set yourself a target, you'll find yourself living a whole life up to the point of death in such a way that you did not fulfill the role that Allah placed on your shoulders of passing the candle on to the next generation. What you taught them is, look, life is all about making money. You make money, you sit. A lot of us teach our children this without realizing. Life is all about making money. When you've got your, 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 your car state of the art, your house state of the art, and you've got everything set for you, a brilliant salary or a nice business that has so much and it's growing and so on, then you're successful. A lot of us, we, we don't realize that that's what we actually tell our children without even speaking to them. Because they watch us. Where's dad? He's at work. Default answer. But the time, it's so late. Dad is at work. Couldn't dad cut out a little bit of that working time? Couldn't he shift his working place after a certain period of time, you know? You might want to change the, the, the area of work if it has come to hinder your relation with your children. Because this is more important than that. So mothers sometimes couldn't be bothered. They don't spend enough time. And sometimes, I know, we are not saying all the time, I know that a lot of our mothers are very, very dedicated. But sometimes not. And this is why we need reminders. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really uh, to open our doors in that regard. So this is the role and the responsibility of the parent that I've just spoken about. Uh, the role and the responsibility of the parent in order to remove or in order to help the child uh, grow from dependency as a child to independency as an adult. The next uh, point that I have, point number two, is the understanding of your child. I will mention six points. They're called the six A's. When we speak of parenting, we have the six A's. Some of you might have already gone through them in different workshops. But these six A's are very common. And we need to know them because uh, we learn a lot from them. We must apply them in a correct way. And it's taken even from the Islamic teachings. You see, just to make mention of what we learn from the Quran regarding parenting. People might think, oh, this is a topic that... Uh, you know, it's not directly in the Qur'an. Wallahi, it is directly in the Qur'an. Allah has made mention of the powerful relationship between Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son, Ismail. And how they grew to the degree that the day the law of Allah came, the child is telling the father, do as Allah has ordered you. Imagine how many of us, uh, our children will tell us that, you know, do as Allah has ordered you. Subhanallah. So this was the nurturing, the upbringing, the closeness. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the Kaaba, he could have done it alone. But no, he chose a little son of his to help him. He says, no, come. Why? Because it's a sense of responsibility. The child knows I'm supposed to be fulfilling you know, my duty unto Allah. When Allah says something, I do it and so on. So that is in the Quran. All these are parenting skills which we can go through and we can learn. Look at Luqman, the wise, Al-Hakim. Allah has mentioned an entire surah after him, yet the point being raised in that surah 
is the advice of Luqman to his son and he starts off by saying, Ya Bunayya la tushrik billahi. Oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Brothers and sisters, for your information, that's the crux of our life. The crux of it. Do not associate partners with Allah. And we need to learn what is the meaning of association of partners with Allah. We need to know it. You know, when you have, uh, I can give you many examples. One of them is when you have a job interview, you will learn oh, what is it all about? What should I say? What type of questions will they ask? And so on. And you want to go into that interview knowing that I am well equipped and I, perhaps I'm going to get that job. You want to go in it with a positive attitude. What about the whole life that we have when Allah says the whole reason why I have created you was so that you can worship me in a way that when you return to me, you will earn paradise and those who have remained behind, you have left for them such a beautiful example that the reward of that example, you will achieve even after you've come back to me. Subhanallah. So, people think, we won't engage in shirk. No, shirk is something big. We're not going to engage in it. We don't. We don't, we don't make sajda to anyone besides Allah. But we don't realize that you haven't learned enough for that interview of yours. Sometimes we associate our money as a partner with Allah. Sometimes we, yes, we do. Ta'isa abdu dirham, ta'isa abdu dinar. The hadith speaks of a loss and a destruction to the person who worships the dirham and the dinar. Imagine that's the wording of the hadith. Not talking of the UAE dirham or something, no. A dirham and a dinar referring to the silver and the gold. But it's so interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is speaking to us about how a person who worships wealth is at loss. He did not say don't, don't earn. You can go out and earn. Earn the millions and the billions. Live a comfortable life. Enjoy your life. MashaAllah. Why not? But make sure that you have done it in a way that you've prepared equally or more in fact for the akhirah. So like we are saying, Luqman alayhi salam, Allah mentions the story in the Quran, not because it's just a good tale. No, because it is the parenting skills that we need to learn. And I have to leave some homework for you, inshallah, so you can go out and read it. Of late, I've been promoting the Sahih International uh, Translation. If some of you have seen it, very simple English, go and read it. See, Sahih International, I'm sure you'll be able to get it here at Manar as well, inshallah, by the will of Allah. If not, they will get it for you. So, the truth is, we don't even know the Qur'an sometimes. So, how do we know these parenting skills? I told you of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Luqman alayhi salam. Let me give you another one. The issue of uh, Nuh alayhi salam with his son. That's, that's something. To learn what is your duty, what's your responsibility. And thereafter, there comes a time when you can do very little about a problem, an issue. You know, he called out to his son and he told his son whatever he had to say. Sometimes uh, the family members become difficult at a certain age, at a certain stage. You need to know when to blame yourself and when you can still feel, Ya Allah, I tried my best, the rest is in your hands. You know, up to the age of perhaps 16, 18, you know, the age of majority, people make a noise nowadays on the globe saying that uh, what is the, the minimum age of marriage? There's a question across the globe. People are discussing it, Muslims and non-Muslims. What I've learned, subhanallah, is from a purely secular point of view, the, the, the age of majority is increasing. The age of majority is increasing where it used to be 16, some countries pushed it to 18, and now they want to take it to 21. I don't know if you're following what we're saying. See, these children are doing this to me. Did you see that? <laughs> They're hearing 21. Oh, you mean we have to wait till 21? Don't worry, your turn will come, inshallah, by the will of Allah. You know, when we were young, we used to think, am I ever going to get married? <laughs> now, mashallah, we're sitting with multiple wives. Alhamdulillah. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. So, so uh, this is the thing that people, they, they, there comes an age when the child develops and grows, and that, that age, it's not a fixed age. E each child differs, you know. Maturity also depends on your environment. So some people... I, that I have spoken to in, 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 the, in some of the Middle Eastern countries will tell you that many years back when there was no system of education similar to this, our children were not uneducated, but they went into their field from an earlier age. I was reading an article two years ago where the British were deciding 
to let children go into their field from a very early age rather than learning so many subjects that they might not benefit from. To be honest with you, keeping a child at school up to the age of 24, varsity, is now being looked at as a waste of years, waste of time, the energy of a child. People rule the world at the age of 17, 18, 20. So many rulers we can we find of, of, past, of the past who ruled at a very young age. So now if they were married at the age of 15 and a little bit earlier, how can we make a noise when they ruled so many... You, you know, if we were to put a pencil mark around what they ruled, for example, you would find so many nations. So what we say is maturity and perhaps the age of majority in different places is now being looked at differently from a secular point of view. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. But from an Islamic point of view, there comes a stage in the life of a child when the child becomes responsible. We have put that age, pegged it at 15. If that particular child has not already matured or reached puberty or sexual maturity as they would call it. When a child, for example, arrives at puberty, puberty, everything becomes further than the child. Have you ever spoken to the child before that? Sometimes, eh, he's only 15, but he needs to know. I have a son who's 12. MashaAllah, he's taller than me. He's taller than me. By the will of Allah, I look at him and you know, now he, he, he can lead me in salah because I know he's an adult. Amazing. And no matter how well I think I can read the Quran, but I will make him lead me in salah because he, we need to pass the candle, pass you know, the torch, should I say May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So, let's get to these A's that we were talking about. The first one is attention. You need to listen and notice. You need to give your child a lot of attention. Something, there is an attention deficit disorder that people speak about. Uh, these are all complicated words that uh, describe a, a condition. But we would say, you need to listen to your child. You need to make, give them that importance. You need to make sure that you notice the child. A lot of us today, my mothers and sisters, my fathers and brothers, uh, it happens perhaps to me sometimes as well, so I want to mention it to you. We're busy with our phone. We're busy doing something. And the child has spoken to you for 15 minutes. You don't even know what the child said. You don't even know the 10 questions the child asked you. And it happens every day. I can imagine the women saying, no, not only to the children, he does it to us. They do it to us as well. See, that's a problem. We do it to each other, to be honest with you. Where? We're sitting on our phone, we're sitting and it happens. Look, because nowadays we become so engrossed in something that we, we cut out, block out, black out, whatever there is around us without realizing that, you know what, switch this thing off and carry on. Listen to what your children have to tell you. Listen to them. See, spend a bit of time. Stop for a moment and say, yes, my son, talk to me. Or tell him, can I speak to you in five minutes? Or perhaps in ten minutes? And don't let that 10 minutes become Dubai time, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> well, I shouldn't be saying Dubai time because I've heard some good things about this place. Really good things, you know. If they tell you half nine, then by the will of Allah, 25 past nine, we're there. Alhamdulillah. That's what happened to us today. My mashallah. So, uh, it's important for us to give the child attention to give the child attention. This is the first A, attention. Uh, if you don't give that child attention, uh, children have it in them that they need attention. They will get it from someone else. Or anyone who shows a little bit of it to them will be able to control them completely. Sometimes. With us, if you want to have a big say in the life of your child, give them a good attention from the early age. Attention, child. And Part of this is in Islam, we are taught that if you have more than one child, give them equal attention. In the sense that, do you know that Allah has given us all different complexions, different sizes, different intellects, different abilities, different challenges. All our children are not the same. We, can, we cannot hold those against the child because that's from Allah. But we do find Muslim parents not giving attention to a certain child because of the looks of the child or the results of the child at school or this or that and favoring the other one. Whereas that is a major sin. It is haram. It is something that is serious. You are not allowed to do that. You, so many children who are suffering today are children who say, my, my brother is favored over me. I'm the black sheep. I'm sure you've heard that. Some of us as adults might have felt that, you know what, I'm the black sheep in my home. My father, may Allah forgive us as parents and may he forgive our parents if they've done that. 
Never. You need to give more importance to those who have perhaps, a, you know, challenges, greater challenges, in a way that we would be balanced. May Allah grant us this. Uh, the reason I paused is because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, once a person was giving something to one of his children, and the Prophet ﷺ asked him, have you given this to all your children? And he said, no. So the Prophet ﷺ corrected him and told him, you either give it to all of them or you don't give it. One of the two. We need to make sure that we learn from this. These might seem like simple words. If I were to sophisticate them and put it into a big research, people would look into them much more seriously. But the hadith is always simple. The Quran is always simple. It comes up with uh, the rules that govern my entire life in a very simple way, in the form of a story. Like I said, Luqman alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. There are so many other examples in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of how there will come a day when the children and the parents will be separated. You, they won't be able to help you. And Allah speaks so many times in the Quran to say your wealth and your children, they, they, are, not going, they are a test upon you. They, they cannot come on the day of Qiyamah to help you unless you have utilized them in the correct way. Your wealth as well as your children, you've brought them up in the correct way. Let's get to the next A. The second A is acceptance. So we spoke about attention, now we speak about acceptance. Also connected, but we need to understand the child, show an interest in the life of the child. Show the child that you are a part of us, you are a part of me, you know, we are one, and so on. There is an acceptance of the child and what the child uh, stands for or what the child does. Because as the child grows, the child will do things based on what we have done, what we have chosen, what we have said, and so on, if we have played the correct role in the life of that child. And we need to show acceptance to that particular child. The third A is approval. Approval and acceptance are quite close. How they have differed here is to show it verbally as well, to praise your child, you know, to value your child, make sure that the praise comes from you. If the praise doesn't come from you, some parents, I know the older generations, uh, some of you might have seen it and some of us might be like that. May Allah protect us and help us to change. They never praise their children. Never ever. The child can be top. Dad is just looking down. Sometimes they'll just tell you, you could do better. Come on, man. <laughs> Say something. You know, I got 99.99. They say, yeah, I got 100%. You could do better. But how? You could have written a neater. You know, they'll raise, bring something. So in, in that way, we are not acknowledging. Even the Prophet ﷺ says, when someone does good to you, return the goodness with goodness. If you cannot, the minimum is to say, Jazakallahu khairan. Why? What is that? May Allah recompense you. Imagine your child has worked so hard. It's a different example altogether. But to acknowledge you plays a big role in the nurturing of the child. You know, I tell my son, mashallah, you know, kids are quite bright these days. And I tell him, I don't expect you to come first in the class. I expect you to try your best. Nobody asks us here, were you first in your class? How many of you have been asked in your field in the last few months as, as a big businessman or a top person in your own company, were you first in class when you were in primary school? Let's be honest. Uh, the reason I'm asking you this is to show you the importance of it. So many top surgeons were not first in class. They were not, but today they are top surgeons. I know of children, personally I know of examples, where the child was not so intelligent in the early days. And when the child turned 18, 19, the mind opened so much that they became so wise and so successful, so intelligent, that it was like qada for what was done in the past, subhanallah. And I sit and I think that, yeah, Allah, look at this. This child is so sharp. But a few years ago, I know some teachers just lost hope with the child. You know, there was one child I know, they went to a hip school. And uh, four or five days later, the, the, the teacher came back and said, this child will never become a hafiz. Now, sometimes, you know, it's a weakness of, of, of the tutor as well. And sometimes the tutor is not prepared to put in so much effort because of the volume of uh, children, the number of children they have, for many reasons. But to say never, that's something that's not the way to look at it from a leader. So this child will never become a habit. Today, that, the, the child they were speaking about, 
now is perhaps in, in his 20s and what a beautiful child. What an intelligent boy. What a powerful hafiz. What a great man. MashaAllah. And I sit and I say, must be his mother's dua. Wallah, it's a fact. That's why I started with that point. Make your dua. Must be the concerns of the parents. Somehow, mother must have said, Inna lillah. I want my child to become a hafiz. And look, the, the ustad is saying no. And that brings me to another point. Just quickly because, you know, we, we, the discussion is interesting. Sometimes a lot of us say, my child must be a hafid, he must be a, he must be a this, he must be a, a, you know, a scholar of Islam, he must be this. And it's just words. I want. It's not like you go into the shop, you know, and you just put it into your trolley and walk out with it, right? I got a hafid, I got an alim, mashallah, I got a sheikh, I got a qari. And now let's get to the till, pay for it and move out. It's not like that. But we think it's like that because we've become so business minded. If you want your child to be a hafid, it starts when the, when the child was still conceived and maybe even before that. I definitely know of mothers and this was an experience that I have actually you know, studied and something I've gone through and I've asked people to do and I've seen the result of it. Those mothers who listen to the Quran and who listen to that which is beneficial throughout their pregnancy, the child is a much more calm child. And you can soothe the child with the same tilawa of the Quran even after the child is born. I'm sure the mothers must be saying, yes, you're right. So when and then the child is inclined automatically because imagine when you have uh, a computer, Say you have a mobile phone. This phone I have in front of me, for example, has a firmware. You know, the firmware. That's what makes the phone. You have a software update. What makes the phone is that firmware, the initial. What makes an S2 or an S4 and S4? It's to do with the programming inside it. The outside is just assembly. It's just, you know, perhaps a little bit of a touch and so on. You can do this, do that. But it's the initial thing that you put in. I believe, and we are taught this as Muslims, that... The child from an initial stage, you engrave certain things into the child, which will not come out in a rush. You know, early memories. Yesterday, I met someone who told me that I have a phobia for birds. And I said, birds? Yes, because when I was two years old, I was chased by a turkey. This is a real life example. I was chased by a turkey. Now, I'm imagining a two-year-old child running. And the turkey, you know, behind, whatever it is, you know, and the child is screaming and, the, you know, and, and after that, the child has, now, this person is an adult, adult grown, perhaps late 20s. And this adult is saying, I have a phobia, all birds, I can't stand them. What do you learn about this or from it? You learn that at an early age, something that happened affected the child forever. Those who are molested at a young age, may Allah safeguard all of us and our children. It, it sometimes does things, in a lot of times in fact, it does things to them that, that will affect them, in, or affects them in the future in such a way that they, f they have negative feelings or perhaps they, some people even become suicidal because of that. It's something that happened. And a lot of those who are molested, it's because their prime caregivers, their parents, were not there the way they should have been. That's why. May Allah protect us. I, I have heard of dirty cases where parents have molested their own children. May Allah safeguard all of us. Wallahi, that has happened and sometimes it does happen. Believe me, we need to protect our children. We need to safeguard them. We need to make sure that we... we you know, yesterday I was reading an article about people who have weird inclinations. And the truth is, a lot of it has to do with exposure to sexuality at such an early age. A lot of it has to do with exposure to, 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 this, to, to that which is supposed to be no under 18 at a very early age. And so their mind processes it in a different way. Their system digests it in a totally different way. This is why we say, when, slowly when you discuss with your child, let it come at the right age by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, we're speaking here of approval. Then we speak of appreciation, to acknowledge and to say thanks. If you notice, it's quite similar. Also, affection. We've, I've spoken about love, but now we've translated it to an A, because we want to make it A, you know. The child must be A, A plus, so on. Like I was saying, I always tell my child, I don't need you to be first, but I need you to have tried your best. If you've tried your best, 
I believe that Alhamdulillah you've done well. You know, sometimes first, sometimes second, sometimes third, sometimes you don't feature anyway. Not all the children are the same. So what? I love you. You are still my child. And I believe that you're working hard. And sometimes if the child is a little bit lazy here and there, we, we have to say a few positive words, inshallah. Then we have the, 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 the sixth point after affection is authority. Authority. We need to have rules. We need to have guidelines. A lot of us in our homes, we don't have rules. We just yell what we want the time we want it. We say what is wrong the time we think that we should say it without having set rules. You know, in this house, you need to, we will eat at this time. It's not just a restaurant, you just come here and start ordering your food. Anytime, everyone must just be at your beck and call. No, there are rules. You, if you don't come between this time and this time, then you will be reprimanded in this way. Or uh, whatever else you'd like to set, we'll get to that inshallah in a few moments. But we need to set rules. In this house, you will be dressed in this way. Or when you leave this house, this is how you should be dressed. If you, if you want to mix with your friends, this is what will happen. You want to invite them, this is what will happen. S rules and regulations. Also, time of salah, everything comes to a standstill. We all read salah first. The problem is, a lot of us don't lead by example. Because we don't have discipline in our own lives. No discipline. So how do we expect discipline in the lives of the children? Uh, I spoke about the role and the responsibility, then we spoke about understanding your child through the six A's, for example. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about communication. We've already touched on it. If you want your child to confide in you, they say you must confide in the child. Have you ever heard that? That doesn't mean you go and sob with all your problems to your own child. No. But you don't have to say something to your child looking for support in the child. No, the child is too small. But you say something in order to educate the child. So confide in your child. Sit, have that close moment. Say, you know what, I had a tough day today. But inshallah, I'll try. You know, I, I, I'm working so hard and uh, it wasn't so easy and so on. You know, you're showing this little other side of you to your child. You've confided in the child. Some of us never ever confide in our children about anything. How do you want the child to confide in you? Tomorrow the child will say, Dad, I had a difficult day. You know, there were two guys trying to bully me at school. And now you're listening. You're listening. You, how did you find out? Because you confided in the child about something that was perhaps not really important, but for purposes of education, for getting close to your child. You know, we've got to say things to our children. So. Also, we spoke about listening. I've mentioned the point again, because listening, we've got two ears. Listen. Many of us are quick to dish out instructions, but we haven't listened to what they say. Sometimes we haven't even taken their opinions. It's important to take opinions. And in this way, inshallah, we'll prepare our child for the growing up that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on our shoulders uh, to help the child with. Then I, I said we would talk about discipline. Let's spend a few moments on it. It's point number four on my list here. Uh, discipline is a part of training and responsibility. As a child changes in age, the approach to discipline changes as well. And there is a difference between discipline and punishment. If you discipline a child, you will change the child's behavior. But if you punish the child, you sometimes suppress that bad behavior difference. So if, if a child does something, you say, right, come here, whack the child. What happens? The child will not do that in your presence again. Whether the child did it or not becomes irrelevant because it's to the child because the child only wants to avoid being beaten. So that child will do it behind your back because you just punish the child. You know, punish is a heavy word actually. Nowadays, we like to use soft words. I don't know if you noticed that. People, the world is changing, it's becoming soft, you know. So we have to use soft words to refer to the same thing. So, punishment is a hard word. We know that in Islam, yes, the discipline has its limits. But at the same time, it changes with the changing of time. That which was effective a long time ago is no longer effective today because the environment has changed. You know, a long time ago, or not a very long time ago, when I was young, we could be disciplined through a stick and a cane. And it used to work. Believe me, it used to work. And we used to, we used to get things done. Today I believe that the age of the cane, although it can be hung somewhere, 
And when I say the cane can be hung, we're not saying beat your children up, but what we mean is, you know, uh, that, f that sort of uh, stamp of authority can be there in a beautiful way, depending on your home. But at the same time, that type of penalization or discipline, which is corporal, in today's world does not have the desired impact. In fact, it could have a negative impact. So I would advise you to utilize other means of disciplining your own children. You know, there are so many ways. You need to read about it because in, in an hour and a half, we are not going to be able to go through every little aspect of, of discipline. You have brownie points. You know, you have a, a point system. If you want to play with your PlayStation or with your game, for example, you need to earn so many points. And how do you earn points? Well, here it is. You know, it reminds me of a frequent flyer system where you fly with us, you get so many points. When you've got so many points, you can get an upgrade. And when you have so many points, you can get to a new level of a card, a new tier, and so on. All these systems, apply them in your home. I don't mean go home today and start giving out frequent flyer cards. But what I do mean is apply the system to say, look, uh, you get so many points and then you get to a new level. Then, you, you know, you can get away with things. And in that way, if you have more than one child, the others will be able to look at why this child is uh, perhaps, perhaps, and you know, it must be done within limits. Why this child is being given something that we are not being given, sometimes it's, it should be connected to that child having earned it. Having earned it. So if you want, you can also get it, but earn it. For example, if you get up for Fajr, you get three points. If you, for example, have spent a day having said uh, 20 polite words where they fit, uh, you will get so many points. You might wonder, what is he trying to say? What I mean is, you know, a lot of us want our children to be polite, but we are not polite to them. Do you say thank you to your child? Do you say please to your child? You know, please and thank you, those are only two examples, but the, the vocab is huge. A lot of us are not polite in the home. You come home when you speak to those who work for you, or even your spouse, there is no politeness in the, in the way we speak. So we need, we need to add that to our own vocab, and then reward your children for using the same type of words. So if you find your child speaking to the one who is the helping hand at home in a very respectful way, give the child one point. Subhanallah. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. But sometimes we don't sit and think of these things and then we expect our children just to, you know, uh, understand what we, what we tell them, when we tell them what we uh, want to say. So uh, the issue of discipline, like we've said, it changes with the changing of time. And... Uh, we need to research, we need to go into it, we need to look into it, we need to see the methods of Rasulullah sallallahu uh, You know what, what amazes me about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa obviously everything, but when it comes to the upbringing of children, even though the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were adults, a lot of us put pressure on our children to learn. And I've come across parents who yell and scream at their children just because they want them to do something. But Muhammad ﷺ, he showed so much love to his companions that they say, we all felt we were the most loved by him. So if there were so many people sitting, each one thought, I'm the closest. That's how brilliant a relationship he had with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Can we not have a bit of that with our own children where they feel we are close? You know, I'm so close to my father. And all your children can say that. Not just one. I'm so close to my mom. And he never ever beat any one of the companions because they didn't learn their daily portion of hifth. But they, they were the best of huffad. It's through them that the Quran then came to us. So I always sit with the hifth teachers and I tell them, you know, when I see a stick and the stick is looking a bit worn out, it means it's been used, you know. And I tell them, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he made the best of huffad out of adults. A lot of them were beyond the age of 40. He made the best of Huffar out of adults. He never used a stick with any one of them. Not even one. Subhanallah. So it's, it just it shows our weakness sometimes. Maybe our approach. Maybe the system in the home. Because education is not just sending your child to school and, and expecting the teacher to do everything or the tutor. No. It is you in the home. The environment you create, the importance you give to a certain uh, department of education is the same importance the child will then give. You know, 
Have you seen in some countries how secular education, the children are so disciplined when they enter the secular school, very disciplined, and they, they, they give it so much importance and so on. And when they get to the madrasa, which is teaching them diniyat, for example, oh, they couldn't be bothered. They're screaming, yelling, sitting, whether we arrive late or not. A lot of it has to do with the attitude of the parents. The, because why? Uh, the time is 2 o'clock, I'm supposed to go to the madrasa. Ah, don't worry, I'll speak to the sheikh. But school, 8 o'clock, I'm there at half 7. Why? That's school. So you don't realize that it's your attitude. You need to give importance to both, you know. And more so to the deen. Yeah. So people blame the madaris who are teaching the deen, that are teaching the deen, for example, to say that these madaris are not uh, disciplined enough. Sometimes it's our attitude. And sometimes it becomes a careless attitude of the madrasa because... They see carefree students who come here. No, today I'm going. Imagine at school you would write a letter to ask the, the, the school to say, can I take my child out because of X, Y, and Z today? And if the, we are told no, perhaps we won't. But when it comes to the, the, the Dini Institute, what happens to us, the child tells the teacher that I'm going at 3 o'clock today because I need to go somewhere. I have a dentist appointment. Salaamu Alaikum and I'm out. <laughs> so the Ustad said, Jazakallah. <laughs> Come on, man. Jazakallah <laughs> It's happening. So I, I've seen that there, there is a problem which is, you know, both ways. Not just one side, but both sides. Where we also need to show that importance and give the importance to the school. Like I always tell people who have a Dini Institute that just have a uniform as well. Make, be disciplined. Send, send a few children home when they don't have the uniform. See what happens, you know. But sometimes parents say, well, you know what, I'm going to send my child somewhere else. Because I I'm not used to this type of discipline coming from a madrasa, which teaches diniyat, for example. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us goodness and ease. Uh, we, I, we need to move on because of time constraints. So let's move on to point number five. Uh, the point is resourcefulness. It's important for us to encourage cooperation. Uh, and we, it's important for us to instill Islamic values... Like we say, parenting, the skills of parenting change. The idea is to achieve the same thing. You cannot use sometimes that which was effective on you, on your own child. With me, for example, uh, to this date, Alhamdulillah, my father is still there. May Allah grant him goodness and so on. He just needs to look at me. And I know that, you know what, he's, something's wrong. And I might kick up now that I'm an adult I'll probably discuss and say you know uh, have a little discussion and, and things will, will come up to say uh, perhaps this could have been said that way uh, if I were to lead a salah or to give a talk I think 10 times out of 10 I'll be told something about it to this day uh, and something that okay I, I have been given positives mashallah but most of it would be corrections. Most of it would be how you can do better. Most of it would be how you can excel. Or what you said that you could have worded better. Or how, you know, what the, the epic, the highlight was one day, Ramadan, a few years ago, uh, I, I gave a talk, the first talk after the Taraweeh. And I was, I was aware that it was live. It was being beamed live. And I got a phone call an hour later from my father. And he told me in clear words, very beautiful. He said, you know what, uh, tomorrow when you're speaking, please sit and speak. Yes. And I understood a whole paragraph from that. He's trying to say you were screaming, you were yelling, you came across very strong, and you need to discipline yourself. So tomorrow I want you to lower your voice. I want you to think of what you're saying. Sit down so that you are more, more in control over your discussion. When you sit and speak, it's a totally different discussion. Those of you who are aware of some of my talks, for example, when I'm standing, you know, you have a different energy. You know, qum fa'anzir. It's the proper way of, you know, getting up and warning. The, the Quran says, you know, uh, the da'wah done standing is far more powerful. That's why the Jum'ah khutbah, you cannot sit and just deliver. Because it's a short, powerful, power-packed message. But when you sit you have a different impact. Today we are sitting, it's a softer speech, automatically. So when he told me sit and speak, immediately I knew what's going on. I said this, he's not happy with me screaming and yelling and so on. But he said it in such a beautiful way because I'm an adult. 
Uh, and alhamdulillah, the reason I say this is a lot of us, when we correct our children, or we tell them something, we do it in such a negative way that they don't even want to listen to what we have to say. For your information, what I did do then is the next day I sat, I asked for a little chair, and, and a few days I sat, and then I just shifted the chair away, and I stood, but I made sure that my volume remained, subhanallah, as it would have. This is just a point of learning from what I learned. Uh, it's important also to teach goodness to the child and let the child catch it from your behavior. This is part of resourcefulness. We've spoke, touched on it a little bit, but let the child catch it from your behavior. You know, how you treat your spouse, your child will treat his or her spouse in most cases. Some cases, maybe not, but in most cases. So it's important for us, very, very important for us to go out and to speak or to make sure that the children that are witnessing us get the good example. They see, they learn from us. Go out of your way to address your spouse with respect, to utter words of goodness, words of love. Address with respect, you know. Uh, listen to each other in a way that your children can see that, oh, when mom says something, dad gives it importance. So when I get married, I'm going to give what my wife says a lot of importance. Yes. Why? Because they learnt it. They saw that it worked and they saw that mom is smiling and happy, but mom is crying, depressed. When dad comes, he's in the living room watching TV. Mom says something, he doesn't give an answer. Then he starts screaming and yelling. Then he goes and complains to his friends on the phone and he does this and so on. Children are watching. Believe me, they think that when you get married, well, she's just a worker. She's here to cook your food and she's here for your mother to take control of. That's what they think, really. In a lot of homes, Mothers take control of wives, of their children. So if I get married, and my mother takes control of who I'm married to. Is that why you were married? Well, if, if that's the trend we're set, then obviously it's the wrong thing. It's the wrong trend. We should have a good relation, but it must not be that. And we, we, we need to have a habit. I have a habit. I explain to my mom how much I love her. And I tell her, look, mom, this is a line. Here's a beautiful line. Please don't cross it. There you are. I love you so much. You, nobody can take your place. But here's a line you don't cross, my beloved mom. These are my wives. You want to say something? Tell it to me. I'll tell them. I can say it in a better way. It happens. It works. And sometimes when, when, there, when there may be a misunderstanding, and misunderstandings do happen, we have to take control. And the children are watching us. They know what's happening. They can see. So dad comes in, you have to be a powerful figure with love, with love. But you have to be someone who cannot be trampled over. Affection. Your mother must never feel that you don't love her. No, you do. But she must know that, you know what, you cannot come and boss around my wife. Because that's my wife. And that doesn't mean I don't love you. I really do love you. Maybe you cannot word it how I'm wording it to you now. But in your own way, you need to say things. Because parenting and a successful parent can only be a successful parent when they have minimized their own issues. I've got issues in my home with my... For a woman will tell you, I've got issues with my husband and with my mother-in-law and so on. How can you expect that woman to be a successful parent? There's going to be some form of shortage in her upbringing of her children because she's busy with her, fighting her own battles. So to create that beautiful environment is the duty of the man. And this is why... You cannot impose on your spouse to live in an oppressive house where people are trampling all over your spouse. You need to do something positive about it because that is how you will help the next generation. Otherwise, all we're doing is we're just completing the circle and let it carry on and on and on. And for generations to come, people are going to be oppressing each other because we couldn't stand up in a beautiful way. In a beautiful way. We're not saying go to the house and start creating a disaster. No. In a beautiful way. So it's important for us to know that, inshallah. And I know I've touched on it. It's a, it's a, very, it's a topic that might affect a lot of people. And people might uh, you know, appreciate what was said. But at the same time, I hope and I pray that less people, less people are being affected by it as time passes. Because it is us who can make a difference. You know, when your children are married, give them their space. Give them a little bit of their freedom. Uh, make sure that you don't want to control every aspect of their lives and so on. Uh, you have already 
you should have already given them the skills to uh, manage their own lives by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we have point number six, there, and there is one more point, point number seven. So point number six is conflict management. It's important for us to, you know, to reject the child's behavior, but not the person. So say your child does something that's bad. You can't say you're very bad, you're terrible, you know, you're a horrible person, I don't like you anymore, and I don't want you to talk to me, and so on. That, you are rejecting the person. The child will find it elsewhere, in the friends, in someone else, and so on, and it can result in a lot of issues. But, if you reject the behavior, my son, I love you, but I don't like what you did. You will always remain my son, you know, I, I really, I care for you a lot. Or my daughter, this, and so on, I really care for you, but what you did is not good, you know, or... Uh, you could do better, and so on. So this is an important uh, issue, conflict management, uh, how to reject the, the behavior rather than uh, the child. Also, to be fair but firm. When we set a rule and we do not implement it, you've already given mixed uh, signals to that child. The child will know that my father's got a rule. Don't worry, that's my dad. I'll just go to him and say, oh, my daddy, you know. Oh, Dad, you're looking so young today. You look like you're 20, man. <laughs> you know, and then suddenly you've got, the child knows how to get you to break your own rule. So you need to be very, very fair and loving, but firm. Look, that's a rule. I know I look like 20. I could look like 15, but you're not going to go. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allah bless us. Then, uh, We've also spoken about conf conflict between parents and how that, that behavior affects the child. They love, they love to mimic, avoid anger. Anger is something the Prophet ﷺ says, لا تغضب, لا تغضب, لا تغضب. You know the ahadith. Avoid anger. Anger makes you say things and do things that really are detrimental. And it also sets a very bad example. If you, everyone has a bit of a temper. You know, we have a few. Some have 13 amps, some 15 amps, some have 30 amps and so on. Some 2 amps and some it's already blown. When you talk to him, you already do, Wa alaikum salam. You know, and you're starting to think to yourself, Ooh, this man's already, I don't know what I did to him. You know? So try and have a, a better fuse. Make it from 30 to perhaps you know, 45 amp, where it's so hard to trip you. you know? uh, it's important, because your children are watching, and then even if, if we get upset, you know when, when you phone home, and I hope we do phone home now and again, you know, uh, on a daily basis, perhaps when we're at work, or we message home, inshallah, by the will of Allah, your spouse answers the call and your children are watching. And then they cry or they yell back or they're quiet and looking depressed. All this has a big impact. It has a big impact on your child. This is why parenting is a holistic thing. It's not just one little department, like I said. It's a holistic thing. It's to do with you and your whole life. And then the child follows. We need to use a lot of wisdom and we need to make sure that we apply hikmah. This concept of hikmah is not only in da'wah, but even in our own homes. And in everything we do, this wisdom is something that is important. The last point is positive living. We need to develop a deep relation with our children, create a positive emotional environment to the degree that when the child wants to say anything, they must be able to say it. It's a positive environment, positive living. Your child can say anything to you and how you react to it will result in the correction of the child or appreciation of something that is good. Also, we've already said speak on a one-to-one -one basis to the children. When we, when we want something from the child, rather than dishing out a command, request it. You know, they say, let your child live the childhood age. Some people expect from the child of eight years old to be an adult already. Especially the grandparents, sometimes. Grandparents expect their grandchildren sometimes at the age of eight and nine, sometimes, sometimes, to be adults. And even some parents. So, why are you doing this? But you don't realize that's a child. Let them make their mistakes. Let them grow as children. They want to play. They still want to do this and do that. You know, we, we, we haven't even touched on how to strike a balance between work and play. But sometimes you can work in a way that it, it is so sweet that the child wants to do that work. It's considered part of play. So here the point being raised is uh, to make a request rather than a command to the child. Request the child. There, there is a difference between the two I'm sure uh, we'd be able to tell. Uh, 
it's never too late to change. My brothers and sisters, it's important that we show affection through words and through touch. Touch meaning you hug your child, you embrace your child, you can kiss your child. You know the Prophet ﷺ used to kiss the little children as well. And once his grandson was with him and he kissed his grandson and Al-Aqra ibn Habis was sitting there and he says, how can you kiss the child? You know, meaning the, the, he says, do you kiss your children? I have 10 children, I've never kissed any of them. So the Prophet ﷺ just looked at him and says, Man la yarham, la yurham. Wow. Whoever doesn't show mercy will not be shown mercy. Imagine, why did these words come in this hadith? One of the reasons is Allah has mercy on you when you show mercy towards that which Allah has given you, bestowed upon you. And it also shows you that a kiss for your child is a show of affection and mercy. The child feels that belonging. Oh, my dad, my mom. Some people, some fathers feel, you know what, I can't kiss my child. You know, as the child grows older, obviously you can kiss the child on the head, or you know. Uh, but at the same time, you can even kiss your children on their cheeks. And as they grow older, you, the, the acknowledgement might be in a different way. But it needs to come. And your words, how much you love the child, it needs to come out. We say this normally about our spouses when we talk about marriage. Tell your wife that you love her. Tell your husband that you love him. And keep repeating it in different ways. And show it in different ways. You know, you come home with a rose. People tell you, well, that's not Islamic. To be honest with you, look, it is. It might not be di a direct teaching of Islam, say, go home with a rose. No, but, but to increase that affection and so on, to give gifts and something that will please, what's wrong in it? We are not giving that rose on Valentine's. We're giving it every day. You know the example I gave, people, some people go to the graveyard, masakin, they don't understand that, you know, the roses are not going to help the dead. So they put a lot of roses on the bed. And sometimes romantic people come and they look at the rose on the grave. The first thing is my wife. They think of my wife. <laughs> they pick the rose up and they take it home. But it works. The wife will tell you, I'm not worried where you got it from. Darling, I appreciate that you brought it home. Man, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so we, we, this affection, we speak about it with spouses, but it, it needs to come also with your own children. You know, uh, the child really wants something when they've achieved or done, you know, well in their behavior and attitude, then reward the child sometimes by giving them uh, something. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to also say that it's, it's sometimes unhealthy to just give the child whatever they want just because you think, okay, you know, let me just give this child, I can afford it. No, Some, it's unhealthy. We need to make sure the timing is right. And the fact is, try and bargain, try and gain something out of it in, in a good way. I don't mean a dirty bargaining like you're a businessman. No, in a nice way. Get something out of it to say, you know what, son? Okay, I'll get you this, but, and then you can add your buts in your own system. A beautiful but, inshallah. So we've spoken about quite a bit. Uh, I still have uh, uh, a lot to say uh, in the sense that I've, I wrote two sets of what I'd like to present. But uh, what I've said so far, inshallah, is m more than enough, inshallah, for a dose. Like I said, so many points we probably left out. So many things because parenting is something that we can go on and on speaking about. I can also learn more from your experiences and it's all about learning from experiences. Perhaps some of what, might I, what I may have said might not be applicable in your particular case, but inshallah it's a point of learning and I appreciate the fact that we have sat and listened. Uh, mashallah, one hour, 15 minutes by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khaira. Uh, may Allah bless us all. How are we doing for timing, brother? Okay, if we have, we have 30 minutes of question and answer, inshallah, I'd like these questions to be connected to the topic because obviously we're speaking about parenting. And uh, if I can, I will respond. If I cannot, I'll call on some experts from amongst you to reply, inshallah. Sorry? Yes. Yes, mashallah. This, the, the, are we getting ready for a question there at the back? Someone wants to ask a question? 
it's okay to talk about it. I'm happy to see the children of, this, of, of uh, the school here as well. And alhamdulillah, it's nice to see you guys. Um, you've heard what we've said. So now when you go home, you can tell your parents, remind them that you were told this and you were told that, inshallah. Yes, sir. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair. Um, just have one quick question. Well, actually, there, uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, I have two girls, and um, as a parent living in Dubai, I've sort of lost faith in the educational system that exists in this country. Can you give us some general advice for those parents who are interested in homeschooling their children? And the second part related to the age of maturity that you discussed earlier. How do we move as a society to bring our children back to that age where by the time they hit Balagha, they're actually ready to lead armies and lead nations um, and sort of get married and, and be adults? Jazakumullah khair. Two brilliant questions. I'm sure we've all heard them. Uh, the first one is connected to uh, how <clears throat> the brother says we've lost faith in you know, the schooling system and so on. So what would be your advice perhaps regarding homeschooling or word of encouragement? Some countries do not allow homeschooling. Uh, this country maybe it does, does it? I don't know. Uh, well, it would have to be supplementary. You know, if it does, and I'm going to say it because there might be people who will listen to this later on uh, in countries where it is permissible, it is allowed. Like in South Africa, homeschooling is, is okay, it's fine. You teach the syllabus at home, you can write the examinations. Uh, the truth is, sometimes you can, it might be costly, you will have to come up with a syllabus, you will have to do a lot of work, you have to spend more time, your, your spouse has to be in it with you. Because if only one parent is agreeing to that, you're not going to be successful. You need, uh, you know, the, the system that you are trying to uh, make succeed, you need to, it to be in sync, so to speak. So uh, you will have to do a lot of work and perhaps it might be healthy, it might be healthy to bring a few like-minded people and try and get their children with. But you will then find that you are actually starting your own school after a certain time. So it, it, there are, the, the, it depends what you want to achieve from it. And I do know in South Africa there are some very, very successful modules of people who have homeschooled their children and let them write the, the examinations, the public exams uh, at that particular time based on the law of that country. But obviously if the law of the land uh, or, or the country uh, that a person is living in does not cater for that, in that case, we probably will have to give them some tuition, uh, some extra lessons, and maybe get it down to the bare minimum that they need to get from uh, the system that is there, if it is a system that is not uh, you know, uh, worth uh, relying on. Uh, the, second, the second thing you asked was about the age of majority. In this system of education, sadly, there is very little that we will be able to do to let the child feel like they have full leadership reins at the age of 15. So it's only possible if we uh, have a system that, or should I say, and maybe not only possible, but it is possible if we have a system that starts the development of a child and at the age of 15 you can already have a doctor. Or you can already have, you, you see the, the whole thing that I was raising, the whole point I was raising is the educational system we have right now is a system that ensures that your hands are tied up to a certain age. That's the problem. And I think the fathers of the secular world, even though they are beginning, or the, some of them now are beginning to know or, or to see the, the loss in it, some of them are saying it was intentional to keep the masses and the youth in that bubbling age down, curtailed. So there are two ways of looking at it. If you have a system that you can implement within your own uh, homeschooling group or within your own, uh, if the country permits and so on, you'll be able to perhaps achieve much more, much more. And I found children... Uh, the children of those who travel, and like here, the expats, a lot of you must be traveling, you know, at least back home and come back. And the children of those who travel a lot, if your children travel with you, they learn a lot. One of the biggest gifts you can give your children, not just to take them on holiday somewhere, but to let them travel and see people, different cultures, different, you know, and to talk to them about it and to, to let them appreciate diversity and see it, it matures them and know that they have their values that they will stand by. 
Because the pressure that comes from the whole world comes from diverse angles. If you don't know the angle from which it's going to come, perhaps they may fall prey to that. And if they know it, they will be able to protect themselves. So uh, th there is no simple solution for that, my beloved brother, uh, although we can all work towards that. The sisters, yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Salam. On behalf of all the sisters here, I would like to really compliment you. Mashallah, you gave some very beautiful points for all the mothers and sisters especially because I talk on behalf of the sisters here that they would benefit from. Uh, Barakallah feek. And uh, there's a question by a mother who says, how should one approach waking up children for Fajr prayer and get around all the crying and sleepiness? That's, that's a very important question. You know, if the system in your house is that everyone is awake at that time, the children will automatically be awake. Our system today is we all sleep late. All of us, me included, myself included, we sleep late. Yesterday the brother at 3 in the morning got a message from me. He tells me, what are you doing? I said, don't worry, I'll see you early morning. I, I, I will be there. You don't need to worry whether I sleep or I don't sleep. Subhanallah. <laughs> but we have, a, we have a khalal, we have a deficit in our own system. Of, of sleep and waking up. Here we're specifically talking of Fajr. Fajr. So if all of us have the adoption of the hadith that speaks about sleeping, for example, after Salat al-Isha, trying to sleep early, uh, whether we want to talk about it from a religious point of view, even from a secular point of view, you know the statement which says early to bed, early to rise and so on. But from a religious point of view, if we all have that system in place and we don't let the environment affect that system, it becomes easier for them to wake up. Point number one. Point number two is if we, we need to be awake, at least get your children to sleep early, you know, at that particular time. Because there comes a time when you've just slept enough. You can't sleep no more. You know, I, I've, I've had my full sleep, 10 hours, gone. Now I have no option but to get up. So th that is one angle, the angle of sleep. The other angle is the angle of talking about it, showing the importance to the child of this particular time of the day. And sometimes not only from a religious point, because a lot of us say, get up, Allah will be very upset, you know, if you don't get up. I've heard parents say that, okay? But how does it affect the child you to say that? Say, Allah is ghafur rahim, Allah is merciful and so on. Yes, it's a duty unto Allah, without a doubt. Without a doubt, it would be a sin, you know, at, especially at a certain age when, you, when, when it becomes farad on you, then it's a major sin. But for us to, st to use other examples, you know, the air early morning is very fresh and so on. And you know, those who get up, they have a good day. Speak of other aspects, the other things, the other benefits of getting up. And like I say, lead by example. That, that is something that, is, uh, that I find very, very important. Uh, also, from a very early age, if we start... Not getting up the child as such, but uh, you know, to say, come read Salat al-Fajr and so on. But from a, the, the, the age of infancy, if the child is awake at that particular time of the day, the system becomes programmed. The system becomes programmed. And as the child grows older, the, chi the child will be awake. But what we do a lot of the times, now my daughter is nine years old, for example, and we start saying, right, from tomorrow, you get up for Salat al-Fajr. Come on. For nine years, there was nothing happening. Now, from tomorrow, I must get up for Salat al-Fajr. They look for loopholes, you know, this way and that way. Allahu Akbar. So, uh, I know I've just mentioned a few pointers. Obviously, people might want to share ideas with one another. And I found this very beneficial that parents, you get together at a school of this nature, discuss your points of success with one another. Look, I tried this with my child and mashallah, I found it very beneficial. This is why we have some working groups, you know, workshops where we get into smaller groups and we can discuss how I learned, how I benefited, uh, how do you, because your environment might be totally different from mine. And maybe what you uh, come across might be totally different. There will be people who have something similar to you in terms of environment that have done something that has really achieved for them. It was only that they didn't share it with you. Had you given them a platform for them to share it with you, share experiences, it would be good. So maybe uh, Manar can look into this as well. Sometimes they might have already had it, but have little workshops of sharing experiences regarding a topic. And inshallah, it can help. Yes, sister. Yes, the sister. Uh, when the children back answer or speak rudely, how do you handle them? especially when they are teenagers? Uh, it's important to talk to them with respect in return. You know, we don't, when, the, when a child uh, swears, or back answers, or, you know, 
when we say answers you back, so to speak, which means disrespect, in disrespect, you know, spite or whatever else, yells, swears or something. If we reduce ourselves to the same, we will never solve the problem. So you need to respond with respect, sit the child down, look, you know what, do I deserve that? Do you really think that, you know, I... Uh, you need to have these moments with your child, these moments of, you know, a sober discussion, which is very intimate, very close. You know, my son, I'm your father. Look, I've, uh, there's a duty on my shoulder. I don't want to be horrible and bad, but we need to make sure that you grow up with some discipline. You need to have this. You need, that's why we're trying to tell you what we tell you. And if I went wrong, I'm sorry. You know, learn to apologize for your mistake when you have committed an open error. You can tell your child, I'm sorry. I really, I apologize to you. Some of us never apologize to anyone. In fact, you have a system. I don't know whether it's a cultural system, but where adults are not allowed to apologize to those younger than them. So much so that even your mother-in-law, she might have oppressed you completely. To say sorry? No way. To her? Impossible. No matter what I did. I hope that's not an attitude amongst us, but it is in some cultures. And if that is the case, we don't solve the problem. So with our children, inshallah, if we want them to apologize to us, we need to, when we, when we have done something wrong, we apologize to them. Like I say, you have a good moment with them, you explain to them, sit them down with respect, inshallah, it will have a positive impact uh, by the will of Allah. Yes, sister. One more from the sisters. Don't worry, inshallah. I see they have a pile of papers, you know, I'm trying yeah, to... Yeah, because I was told to, yeah, ask the brothers, but there's a question. How does one deal with peer pressure at school? Uh, peer pressure is not something easy to deal with at school. I've seen schools have departments of handling peer pressure. I, uh, the, the, the school that uh, my uh, son goes to, uh, in fact, the, the, the high school that he's about to enter, is the school that I went to as well. Uh, there is a special person in charge of looking into these matters. It's a whole department, believe me, because it's become so bad in a lot of the schools globally, I think, that they've created a special department where the child can go, confide, and it's not like they're going to be exposed, but you need to say what's happening. You know, the, 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 there are two things here. One is bullying, and the other is peer pressure. Peer pressure can either lead you to do that which is right, and that's very rare. And a lot of the times it leads you to do that which is wrong. So if people are putting undue pressure on your child, the child needs to know, the child needs to communicate, at least say it, and don't overreact. Also, I know the type of peer pressure you might be speaking about is, for example, the life we're living and the life people live. You know, there is, we're trying to, to, to guide our children in this line, but everyone else is on another line. So to marry the two becomes so hard because we cannot marry good with bad, for example. But you need to teach your child to live in an environment that might be adverse, still with good qualities. And to do that, you need to lead by example. You need to constantly communicate because I believe the education in the home reaches a deeper point in the heart than that which is at the school. Although some might think differently. We think, oh, you know, at school. School, they're going to give you knowledge, or should I say, information. And you at home, you have the social touch, you have the emotional touch, you have so much more given to you by Allah. But if you utilize that correctly, you will be able to reach the, a deeper point in the heart of the child, where the child understands, you know, uh, there are schools that are non-Muslim schools in non-Muslim countries where sometimes they do things uh, that, that are un incorrect Islamically. We need to just speak to our children in a beautiful way and educate them. The less we communicate or uh, the more abrupt our um, communication is, the less impact we will be able to have on our children. The greater the impact, the less they will feel the peer pressure because then your environment uh, is more important than the environment that the peers have created. And I just want to mention one last point before we go to a question from the brothers. And, uh, and that is, as parents, it's important to choose the friends of your children at an early age. Later on, you won't be able to have a say. But what type of a school did you send your child to? Was it, the, was it a very affluent school where only the kids of the rich went? It comes with a bit of a package. You have to work a little bit harder. Because you, you might be trying to achieve something from the educational aspect and you might lose something from another aspect so strike the balance 
Make sure you have made the right decisions. For example, you visit the families of those whom you trust, the way they bring up their children, in a way that your children befriend their children. This is a very important point. Sometimes we have friends and we visit them with our families. But their example in their home is not good enough for our children, yet we become upset when our children want to be like them, but we are the ones who introduce them into the house of the other. Like I say, you have a business partner. He's your business partner. If he's a bad person, just keep him as a business partner. He doesn't have to come to your home and enjoy your meal and mix with your family and his children come and they got bad habits. And every time they leave, your wife is complaining and your children, you know, start swearing and they're learning new different things that they're not supposed to or something they're not supposed to be doing. Whose fault is it? Well, you took your business partner a little bit more in the embrace than you should have. So it's important to make sure you mix with the right people and you allow in your home whom you are comfortable with the fact that their upbringing of their own children would be in sync with mine or something similar to the degree that if my son becomes a friend of his son, I don't think I would have a big issue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. These are just some points. Remember, like I said, this may not solve the problem, but it's just to get us thinking inshallah. I'm just sharing with you something. Yes, the brothers here, uh, someone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi What is the right age and time to separate the children to sleep in uh, other room from the parents? And the second question is, uh, what are the ethics the children should follow while entering the rooms of the parents? Jazakallah. Jazakallah khair. My beloved brother, that's a very, very beautiful question. Uh, firstly, I'll deal with the second part of the question. You know, in our houses, uh, a lot of us don't have knocking the doors but we should introduce it even amongst each other you know brothers and sisters and so on just introduce it but you need to do it knock on the door of your child can i come in people saying i'm a father i'm a parent i can walk in anything there are times when you might want to walk in uh, based on you know seeing what your child is doing and so on but uh, that's not all the time that's once in a while but if you are to you know knock on the door before you enter the, and you train the child to knock on your door that is a proper etiquette the brother knocks on the sister's door, the sister knocks on the brother's door. And you know, there are two things. Sometimes, this happens in my house, my own house. When the door is knocked, sometimes the person understands that you're calling them, maybe to eat or to, you know, we have tea together, for example, at five o'clock. And maybe they think that, okay, you're calling them for the tea. So they'll say, coming. And they hear it as come in. So they come in. <laughs> but what you said is, I'm coming. Meaning, you know, you can carry on, I'll be there just now. So, we need to choose a different word sometimes. Because to confuse a child like that, or even an adult, sometimes can be confused. So we need to choose a different word. I say, uh, it's just something that came to my mind. But knocking on the door is very important. And this isti'dhan is something we need to instill in the children. Do you know a lot of us do not have discipline in our homes? A lot of us take it for granted. You know, we might be professionals in our own way, but in the house, we have no rules. We have, or, or, it's not like a rule that you're trying to make the life uh, of your children and family members difficult, but that discipline goes a long way in building your child. So, the knocking of the door, I've already spoken about it. Introduce it in the home, inshallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if they come into your room, knock the door and they can come in. But the first point is even more important. Some people have a home made of one room. Because they can't afford it. I, I know uh, at one stage, perhaps a long time ago, perhaps my family went through the same. You just have one big room and you know, there's a corner there which we cook in and a corner there which uh, you would sleep and a corner there, that, that is, you sleep at night but during the daytime everything is laid out in a way that no one even notices this is a bedroom as well, you know. So people have that and I, I believe maybe some expatriate workers might be having the same thing here as well, maybe, perhaps, I'm just guessing. Uh, in that case, it becomes a little bit more difficult where uh, the, 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 the hadith referred to is to be sleeping in the same bedding, under the same sheet. That would be wrong beyond the age of 10. It would be wrong. So I cannot sleep on the same bed, under the same sheeting, with a child who is above the age of 10. That's the hadith says, separate them in bedding. So they have their own little covering and they have their own little spot, so to speak. But if we have the facility 
and we have more rooms in the home, then obviously your child cannot keep on coming and sleeping with you. A lot of people today, they, they have a one child spoiled. So the child sleeps with mom and dad. And you know, until the child is such a big adult, you know, they're sleeping between the two. Come on. Not only does it depict a bit of a domestic problem, but it, it, it is unhealthy. It's unhealthy for the child. And really, it's, it's unhealthy for you and for every. You need to make sure the child is used to. That's why I have a habit. When my children are born, from day one, there is a cot. Day one. It's not going to do with love or anything because it's got to do with wanting the child to grow up in a way that it does not feel like it's missing something because the coziness is not there anymore. The mother is there, mashallah, you know, the, the feeding of the child and so on. Everything is in place. But sleeping time or whenever the child, you can just put the child a little bit on the side. So the child knows. From, and a lot of us here are fortunate. I think here we have bigger homes, the bulk of us where we can uh, afford that for our own children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. So separating them from beddings, that's a ruling. But from the room itself, if you can, yes, you should. Like uh, when it comes to the boys and girls, give them their free space. Uh, you know, try and let them grow up themselves uh, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah for raising that. At least we've highlighted it, my brother. And maybe we can even go deeper into it by studying and researching the Islamic viewpoint uh, in a more detailed manner. Uh, the sisters will take one from them, inshallah. This is equality, my brother. It's like five and one. Uh, like one. Yes. Uh, when we are trying to uh, bring up the children to the best of our abilities according to Islamic teachings, but the behavior of the grandparents are not the same and we don't get the right support from them. So, how do we manage that? It makes your challenge a little bit, uh, you know, more difficult. But that is a, a crisis that we are facing when we are, say, we have, we have parents who are not so religious, for example, or they are not so much on a line that we would like to be on. And then when we have our children, and we just the children might be inclining towards goodness, and the grandparents say, no, 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 what? You're so young. What are you going to the masjid for? Have you ever heard that? You know, you're so young. Why are you putting on a scarf? Come on, man. And and you're saying, but dad. You know, or oh, but mom, and so that is a crisis. We need to try and speak to them, communicate. It, it shows lack of communication with parents. And normally, if you're a man and you're living, for example, in close proximity with your in-laws, let your wife do the talking to her own parents and you do the talking to your own parents. Because what I've noticed, when a wife speaks to her parents in law, the impact of it is far less than when the own son speaks to his father and mother. And in a beautiful way to say, you know what, we, we you know, I am a little bit blunt sometimes because I know I've got a good relation. I can say, you know what, uh, I can tell people's parents who've come to me for, to solve a problem that, listen, you have had your time to bring up your children now let them bring up their children you know you had your say now let them have their say uh, I had one major crisis where they, they, they were naming a child in the in the home the naming of the child became such a big issue because the grandparents are saying but it's the right of the father but I'm the father of the father okay relax <laughs> how's that one you know and he was speaking in Urdu, which made it sound so bad, you know, we have you know. I said, oh, relax. You know? <laughs> so so I, I, I was just, I said, okay, you know, Allah gave you a chance. You kept these names. Now you want to keep everybody's name, everybody's name, you know. And I made a joke out of it, say, because he was a big businessman. I said, I think you get all your workers and say, well, I'm your boss. I can name your kids, you know. So you need to know you might be high, you might be a boss, but that doesn't give you the right to do things that's not a part of what is your responsibility. It is the father's right. And we would recommend that he takes the opinion of those who are going to be calling the child. Because uh, once when I traveled to a certain country, I asked a, 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 a young boy, what's your name? He gave me a, he started reciting, you know. There were about five, six names. I said, why? How come you've got such a long name? He says, this was my father, this was my grandfather, this was my mother, this was my grandmother. They also, all the names, you know, they said, we don't want to fight, so just take all of them, you know. <laughs> so, so then I, I made a joke out of it and I said, well, when they say Abdullah, You'll say, yes. When they say Muhammad, you'll say, yes. When they say the other name, you say, yes. So everyone is just you. I said, you got a problem. Subhanallah. 
But uh, the, the, the issue of being in sync with the grandparents is very important and we need to understand. And I think if we cannot solve the problem now, then at least the next generation, we will be the grandparents, so don't repeat the problem. <laughs> because I always believe if you can't solve it today, don't let it carry on. You know, a lot of us have this attitude where we say, well, my father did it, so I'm going to do it. That's not how it should be. If he was right, then do it. Because it was right, not because he did it. And if he was wrong, then don't do it. Because he was wrong. May Allah make, make it easy for us. And really, may we become the best fathers-in-law, mothers-in-law. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about mothers-in-law uh, because they are the best of people. Without a joke. They are the best. I know a lot who are really good people. My mother is also a mother-in-law, to be honest with you. Beautiful person. Beautiful people. But I'd like to believe when we become mothers-in-law and fathers-in-law, we will be better. Allahu Akbar. That's called positive wording, inshallah. They are excellent, but we will be even more by the will of Allah. So we won't repeat the same blunders. A lot of people don't. And sadly, those who are so difficult, they haven't had their own mothers-in-law uh, or fathers-in-law. So they become very difficult because they don't know what it tasted like. May Allah make it easy. In a lot of cases, it happens. Uh, I've just been told we have the last question to be taken. So there is going to be a polarization between the sisters and the men. So the brothers, you can interact with me a little bit later. The sisters, that won't happen. So we will take it from you. Sorry, that was just a verdict. Yes, um, that there is a mother here who will ask you a question herself. And uh, before I give it to her, there's a small question by another mother who says, she wants to know if my child is allowed to attend birthday parties of his friends, classmates, whether Islam allows that. And while you answer, I'll give it to the other mother she wants to ask herself. Okay, you sure there's no smaller question than the small question that came in? Because what I noticed is when we said there is one question, uh, diplomatically, mashallah, there was a small question and a smaller question, and perhaps a part B of the same question. <laughs> Yes, let's hear the other question from uh, the mother, inshallah. Hello, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Brother, I want to ask you this question about... Uh, uh, okay, uh, many females might be facing this problem at home, that when we have daughters, uh, the fathers, they support the daughters too much. I mean, they just say, like, don't tell them anything they are right or give them whatever they want when they are throwing tantrums or anything. So it's very difficult in such a situation to like, you know, um, bring up the child. In such cases, what advice do you have for the mothers as well as um, the husbands? Jazakumullah khair. A beautiful question. Uh, the question about our daughters, sometimes they, they are dear to their fathers because the fathers know that she is going to get married soon. And you know, if, when she looks at me when she's old, she will say, oh my dad, because a lot of the husbands won't probably give them what you know, they would get at home. Uh, however, you know, let's become more serious with that. We need to realize that giving in, I spoke about it, giving in to everything that your child would like is not a depiction of love. Sometimes it, it is actually a sign of immaturity to the degree that the same child might not forgive you later on. Dad, you did not discipline me. Wallahi, my brothers. I want to tell you something. When I was in, this is a true story and it's valid. When I was studying in Medina Munawara, I had a friend who was with me a lot of the times. And I used to be very direct and open, and he did not like it. We had fights because I used to tell him, this is wrong. You're not supposed to do this. This is like this, and this is like that. Whatever it was, I can't remember every detail, but I know there were a few instances where it was really bad, bad relation. We actually stopped talking to each other for a while. And then it would come back again, because we were friends at the end of the day. Wallahi al-Azim, wa rabbil bayt. Last night, he sent me a message. Years later, if I read that message for you, I think I will read it straight from my phone to show you and to prove to you something. The brother says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sorry, I'm just taking a few minutes to look for this message. Here it is. <clears throat> he says, Assalamu alaikum. I'm watching you on ITV. ITV is a channel. 
you are speaking about when someone corrects you, you must not feel bad. Even if he is direct. And wallahi, you used to be direct in Medina, and I would feel bad. But I want you to know that I have benefited a lot from that criticism. Jazakallah. Did you hear that? So I was blunt and he says, when we were young, he says, this is a message I got last night, out of the blue. It's a WhatsApp message. And amazing, I sent him back a message to say, I love you, my beloved brother. That's all. And the reason I'm saying this is, today, I can tell you 15, 20 years later, he's appreciating the fact that we, it, I didn't just agree and carry on and okay, my friend and so on. So this is what happened. Now, it might take long. The same applies, in fact, in a bigger way. When we, I always tell people who have daughters, bring them up in the, in the, in the best possible way with the discipline that when they get married, life will be easier for them. They'll say, phew, I'm in such a beautiful home. My husband is so relaxed. My dad used to be quite strict. The reason is, if, if we do the opposite, it becomes more difficult for them to actually adopt and adapt. If your daughter was brought up in, in, in a way where she was not allowed to wear this and to wear that, it's, when she gets married, her husband says, I'm not too worried, you can wear what you'd like. Oh, she's so excited because she's, she was never expecting that to happen and here it is, she's given a gift. And if you brought her up saying, wear what you want, the day she gets married and the wife, the husband says, I'd like you to wear a cloak when we leave the home. She's going to say, my father didn't tell me, who are you to tell me? And the marriage starts suffering turbulence. Why? Because dad was too lenient, too lenient. That husband is not dad anymore. He is a man, he expects. And obviously she would also expect from him because it's a give and take. But like, we're talking of one side today where the question came about daughters. This is why I would believe for you to be a little bit more firm with, the, with, with your children would make it easy for them when they grow up and they go into the field on their own and they're independent, they will be able to appreciate uh, what they get at that particular time because perhaps they haven't had it in the past. And obviously it's something very balanced. The last part of that question was regarding birthday parties. Look, to be honest with you, I need to give an introduction to the answer. Islam is a religion I have chosen, you have chosen. Have you chosen it? We've chosen it. Is it from you or from Allah? Are you happy that it's from Allah? So if the dunya tells you something and Allah tells you something else, does it make or which one is more important, the first or the second? Allah. What Allah has said. So even if the whole world is doing something and we are taught that this is not supposed to be done in the deen, we should not be feeling it hard in our hearts to say, Allah, if I die today, I know that I chose to be a Muslim and I chose to worship you and I know it's your rules. You know, it's so difficult today to talk because you're talking to a secular world and, and sometimes they will pick on a small point of yours and they will make it a big issue for nothing, but not realizing that we do believe you are free to choose whether you're a Muslim or not. But the fact that you chose you're a Muslim, you, you are not free to change Islam. That's what we're saying. You cannot come and say, no, uh, you know what, Islam needs to be modified. Well then, tell yourself you're a modified Muslim. Someone says, are you a Muslim? Say, no, I'm a modified Muslim, you know? So people know. But if you want to call yourself a Muslim, you've surrendered. So you need to know there are certain things that people might say, and you might think, oh, this guy is backward, man. How could he say that, you know? But it's, not be it's, not, it's because it's not from me or my pocket. My children would like to also go to birthday parties and celebrate and so on. I sit them down and I explain to them what the candles are all about. Do you know what the candles on a birthday party are all about? In ancient Europe, when the, the, the winters were so bad that people used to go into literal hibernation to keep themselves warm in, in whatever way they had. And when they would come out, they would count the dead. Did you know that? They would count the dead. And in, in order to celebrate the, the fact that those who are alive have passed through the winter and survived and fought nature, which means nature came to kill us in the form of cold. And because we fought nature and we stayed alive, now we need to defy it by blowing out the candle. So they would put how many ever candles of their age and blow them out to show we can defy it. It's something that we believe is rooted in the medieval Europe. 
And it comes with its own satanic origins and so on. But people today say, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm blowing the candles. But you don't realize it's like, it's like an act of worship of the pagans. And we're saying, you know, and people have made it a culture and a tradition. The same applies to so many other things. You know, like Valentine's and so much. People start saying, but what's wrong? How come these people, you know, you're not allowed to show your love? Well, to be honest, we are being fooled by believing that, you know what, uh, you need to celebrate the fact that you're, you're one year older by throwing a big party, everyone must come, but you don't know that now you're closer to your grave, for example. Or there are more responsibilities on your shoulder. I'm not saying... That when your age turns, that you must not make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, grant me a good age and so on. But firstly, we have a Hijri calendar. Secondly, these teachings are foreign to Islam. They are actually incorrect, invalid. But they, are from, they, they come from Allah, not from me, not from you. If I had it my way and you had it your way, we would be throwing parties because our kids put pressure on us, so do mine. But we have to speak to them, address them, try and explain to them, and you know, get to the origins, origins of it. The sad reality is, people take part wholesale. So they'll tell you, but they did it, but these people did it. That's the peer pressure. Sadly, we're living in an age, al-qabidu ala dinihi kal ala jamr. A person who wants to hold fast to the deen is someone similar to he who is holding fast to you know, a red hot coal, for example. So you find uh, even families which are supposedly religious, you know, they have these big birthday parties and so on. Whereas it is Islamically incorrect. Wallahu a'lam. Allah knows best. Like I said, I've introduced, I've given you a little introduction before I gave the answer. Uh, there are more important things we could do, you know, than that. And we could have, uh, you know, we could throw a party on a different occasion altogether in order to celebrate other things uh, than to do it the pagan way. You know, I would prefer a graduation party than to have a birthday party any day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our children. May He bless us all. It was wonderful being here. I really thought I would be dozing because of uh, the, the, the responsibilities I've had to fulfill yesterday. Uh, but by the will of Allah, I've been quite awake. Uh, I'm more awake than when I started. So Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah. I really appreciate your attention because to have people seated for two whole hours and perhaps a little bit more is not a joke. Uh, but then again, uh, it was for a good cause, and Allah reward you. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.